will uh, present for 15 minutes each, uh, and then there will be time for questions um, after each uh, presenter, I think. Uh, and please feel free to raise your hand, turn on your camera and ask your question, uh, or simply to type your question uh, into the chat box and either Chris or me will see them and we can put them to the panel. Okay, so let's get started then, uh, shall we? Our first presenter today is Kiran Cross from the Freie Universität in Berlin. Uh, he is writing his PhD at FU on the significance of expropriation law uh, in the process of abolition and decolonization. He holds an LLM in international economic law from Birkbeck College, London, uh, and has worked in the past for a wide range uh, of bodies, including the International Centre for Trade Union Rights, Greenpeace, the Left in the European Parliament, and many uh, other NGOs. Uh, he is going to be speaking to us today on uh, broadly on the topic of uh, policing sovereignty, expropriation without compensation, and the end of history. So, Kiran, please uh, take it away. Thanks very much, James. I'm very pleased to be here um, and to, to present. This is a work in progress and I'm in my first year of my PhD, so um, be very uh, keen to get feedback and um, hear your comments and questions. I don't have a presentation and I'm going to read, which is also a little bit radical for me because I, I didn't do that before, but it's a bit of an experiment, so I hope you're not all full asleep. But I will share something. Uh, I wanted to share this image. I hope you can all see that. Yep. Um, so, um, as James said, the title of my um, talk is Expropriation Without Compensation and the End of History. The whole doctrine calls for prompt, adequate, and effective compensation for all expropriations of foreign investments, irrespective of any public interest. This is widely interpreted as imposing a standard equivalent to full or fair market value compensation. Surveying nearly 450 bilateral investment treaties, Patrick Dunbury found the Hull Doctrine in 94%. Whether the doctrine has achieved status of customary international law remains contested, but its survival is one of the most remarkable episodes of international law of the 20th century. After the challenges of the new international economic order, Hull's ascendancy to near ubiquity at the end of the Cold War invites a certain consonance with Francis Fukuyama's declaration of the end of history. In his science fiction novel, Death's End, Shushin Lui imagines the United Nations insisting on full, full compensation in the case of an expropriated star 250 years in the future. Martins Paparinskis has recently dubbed the valuation standards of international law as potentially crippling and called for a rethink. However, the issue of valuation alone cannot, I think, capture how this limit on the exercise of sovereign power is imbricated in and generative of a, partic a particular pivotal moment in the development of liberal modernity. I'm trying to subject this limit to the critical tool supplied by the black radical tradition, for reasons which I hope will become apparent, to ask how the logic of reparation, as Fred Moulton has suggested, is related to the logic of representation. Moulton continues, what does that relation have to do with telling the truth or the story or the whole truth or the whole story or with truth telling as a way of making whole. Elsewhere, Moulton has noted in a way that highlights the importance of his inquiries into blackness and indebtedness that, and I quote, the case for reparations has been made against us. The whole doctrine's emergence at a critical formative stage in the development of international rules on state responsibility and reparations for unlawful acts has perhaps overshadowed a prior relationship to the Fifth Amendment of the US Constitution. The US takings clause makes any exercise of eminent domain contingent on payment of just compensation, a standard that much like Hull has been equated in principle to fair market value, although neither the terms just nor adequate are truly exhausted by the interpretation as full. Although eminent domain is often qualified by US jurists with reference to Magna Carta or Blackstone's commentaries, it developed during a crucial encounter with the new 18th and 19th century sciences of political economy and of the police. The US takings clause effectively gave legal form to Adam Smith's justification for the existence of government per se, namely to protect the rich from the poor. Its architect, James Madison, expressly intended the clause 
to indemnify slave owners upon abolition. In the antebellum United States, the application of the just compensation requirement to property and slaves was widely accepted. Save for the Civil War, the price of abolition would have been immense. Thomas Piketty has recently estimated that compensated emancipation would have been three or four times costlier than the war itself, in the region of $10 billion in 1865 terms, and significantly greater than the entire US national income. According to Amanda Kleintop, at the end of the Civil War, Lincoln's own cabinet rejected his proposal to offer the slave owning South a compensation settlement of $400 million, but Southerners continued to campaign for compensation until 1868. The precedent for, comp for compensated emancipation came from Europe. Events in Haiti in 1791 set in motion the most significant depropriation the planet has ever witnessed, but the cost was extortionate. In response, France cajoled Haiti in 1825 to agree compensation of 150 million gold francs, equivalent to 300% of Haiti's national income and about 40 billion euros in today's terms, which Haiti only paid off in the 1950s. With the Slavery Abolition Act of 1833, the United Kingdom awarded slave owners compensation to the tune of 20 million pounds, or 5% of the UK's national income. The equivalent today, Piketty estimates, would be 120 billion euros. Britain's slave debt was not finally cleared until 2015. What is perhaps most striking in these trajectories of abolition is that compensated emancipation consolidated what was until then a far more ambiguous terrain. Even in the US, redistributive confiscation was permitted by state legislatures after the Rev US Revolutionary War. Until the period of reconstruction, the Fifth Amendment applied only to federal and not state or local authorities. Prior to the slavery debates, therefore, there was little or less challenge to the idea that property was, to use Morton Horowitz's expression, held at the sufferance of the state. This sufferance was, in essence, the perspective of the police power, a vague doctrinal barometer of community well-being and distributive justice, which was, in Robert Gordon's words, about to embark on a brilliant 19th century career. Familiar to investment treaty arbitration, but practically forgotten to bond parlance, the police power harks back to 18th century expressions of sovereign authority, or further to Greek antiquity. As a legal doctrine, categorizing a sovereign act as an exercise of the police power serves to render it, then as now, as inherently non-compensable. US legal thought of the 19th century thus persistently positioned eminent domain and the police power as either side of a determinative boundary of the obligation to compensate. But what we find in US federal jurisprudence on slavery is a curtailment of the police power that is simultaneously and insidiously also an expansion. When called upon to determine whether states' residual police power might be invoked to secure the freedom of fugitive slaves, or whether the Constitution required states to rather engage in the capture and return of fugitives to their owners, the latter view prevailed. In this period, the constitutional limit to sovereign interference with property unfolded. The takings clause served not only as an injunction against any police power of confiscation, but it also became an injunction for governments to exercise their police powers to prevent property escaping. Frederick Douglass regarded the $150 compensation paid for his freedom as a ransom, proof of the plundering character of the American government in his terms, which had through the fugitive slave, slave laws underwritten his status as property and committed to enforce it. Ultimately, through this legislation and the decisions of the Supreme Court, such as Prigg and Dred Scott, property protection and comity won out in a way that only war could resolve. During the conflict, slaves would be confiscated as contraband, but after the Civil War, the police power would be further invoked to legitimate the segregation laws known as Jim Crow. Sadia Hartman thus suggests that the police power was little more than the benevolent articulation of state racism in the name of the public good. I probably don't need to elaborate on its legacies in the US context today. I do want to suggest by way of this alternative genealogy of the infinitely receding horizon of the non-compensable, that when we talk of compensation requirements in international investment law, more than money is at stake. Property law distributes security and insecurity. George Rigakos and others have noted the gradual narrowing of the police concept and its general conflation with debates about what the state ought to be in political and legal thought of the Enlightenment. Adam Smith, Jeremy Bentham, and Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, among others, addressed the question of this ought in light of the unmistakable hegemony of markets. In the nascent logic of governmentality that pervades this era, it is hard to miss that the science of police is animated by slippage between the public and the private. 
a slippage often fomented by the conflation of the eradication of poverty with the eradication of the poor. In this vein, Mark Neocleos convincingly suggests that it is the inherent insecurity of the institution of private property which brought policing into, power, into being. If this is the case, distributive justice would seem to be poorly served by treating property protection, the police power, and policing as discrete, discrete ventures of the state. I want to illustrate this concern by turning back to investment law and decolonization. Already in 1978, the new international economic order was in serious trouble. Its alternative standard of appropriate compensation and the principle of deference to domestic law, both promoted in the 1974 Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States, were effectively made redundant by the sole arbitrator in the Texaco versus Libya dispute, René Jean Dupuy. One year later, as Zimbabwe's liberation movement emerged victorious from a civil war against a white supremacist regime, the British successfully pressured Zimbabwe's nascent leadership to incorporate the Hull limit into the country's new constitution, entrenching significant odious debt and extreme levels of land inequality. As the then president of Tanzania prophetically warned, it would ultimately prove impossible to tax Zimbabweans to compensate people who took land away from them through the gun. Two decades later, the issue reached boiling point and countrywide mobilizations led to thousands of occupations of white on farms. The government set about expropriating land without compensation, ostens ostensibly for the resettlement of the rural poor. The outcomes and controversies of Zimbabwean land reform are difficult to summarize, but in 2020, the government reversed the policy, capitulating to the demands of dispossessed white farmers and of Western governments by signing a $3.5 billion compensation settlement. Whether and how the country will pay is an open question. Also unclear is the fate of one exit claim bought by German Swiss investors concerning gazetted timber plantations that were first established by Cecil Rhodes British South Africa Company in the first half of the 20th century. In the 2015 Border Timbers Award, the tribunal ordered the Zimbabwean government to restore the investor's title, or failing that, pay around $200 million in compensation. In its defense, the government claimed that its actions were, and I quote, a normal exercise of non-compensable police powers, irrespective of the magnitude of its effects on the investment. This argument received scant attention from the tribunal, but the inaction of the police is referred to in the award nearly 150 times. The subjects of this policing, that is the indigenous communities still occupying parts of the company's plantations, among them headman Simon Masozzi Chinyai, who you can see here in this photo, petitioned the tribunal to participate as amicus curiae, but were denied any voice in the five-year exit proceedings. In their absence, the government insisted that any police intervention in the, in the occupations might have turned deadly and ultimately led to what they dubbed an Egypt or Syria style internal massacre. For their part, the investors extolled enthusiastically the Zimbabwean police as an effective force, among whose number, they say, are units that specialize in civil disturbances, including riots. Ultimately, the, the arbitrators decided that in the government's failure to deploy armed force against the very communities that the tribunal itself had refused to hear, it had not exhausted all existing alternatives to, to land reform. The tribunal enjoined the government to restore the land to the investors, and in its view, the necessity of deploying force did not res render restitution a material impossibility, although, it noted in its words, the possibility of some disturbance should not be overlooked. And so I want to ask how that which sometimes appears under the polite euphemism of regulatory chill relates to what Nahum Chanda has referred to as the dissimulation of a war. Because here, sovereignty is emphatically not in retreat. While the Border Timbers Tribunal has no time for any putative police power of non-compensable expropriation, the police power of the Zimbabwean state is not nullified, but rendered in the service of the investor's plantation, interpolated to maintain what W.E.B. Du Bois predicted would be the defining problem of the 20th century, the color line. According to James Nicholl, whether or not the compensation requirement is legitimate hinges largely on how one perceives what is being restored. The compensatory cannot therefore be neatly delineated from the distributive, and in the case of expropriations, the whole limit, like the Fifth Amendment, simply secures what little distributive justice we know already exists. But to conclude, I think there seems to be something more, some, something missed in this banal reduction of appropriation to valuation per se. And to take a cue from Jacques Derrida's thinking through of the proper, one might legitimately ask if we still need to render an account of the desire to render an account. 
John Burke has suggested that when the abolitionists Olaudo Equiano described the transaction for his freedom, he was trifling with the general equivalence that animates political economy. Equiano paid a guinea for a guinea himself. I want to finally suggest that the policing of the sovereign I have so far implied is also entangled in a submission to the transmutations that the fungible necessarily implies under the conditions of capitalist market exchange. And lest anyone suspect that I'm getting overly flamboyant, transmute is the precise term chosen by the US Supreme Court in its explanation of compensated takings to the Sioux whose land it confiscated. In 1980, the court explained that when the government exercises compensated eminent domain, in its words, it merely transmutes property from land to money. In 1918, the UK Privy Council also gave the indigenous peoples of what was then Southern Rhodesia a lesson in transmutation, suggesting that since they could not comprehend it, they could have no conception of rights. But for the record, the Sioux have refused to submit to the logic of calculus that can only replicate, as Fred Morton reminds us, the horrors of speculation. To date, they still haven't touched the compensation awarded by the US Supreme Court, which is estimated today to be worth over a billion dollars. Thank you for your attention and uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Kieran. That was uh, not your average investment law presentation. Uh, I have questions. I'm looking forward to uh, getting into the discussion, but maybe before we do, it's best if we just proceed uh, through the speaker so that we can try and bring out some of the, the maybe the red threads that run through all three and we can discuss uh, the papers at the end. So um, I've made a note of my questions. I would ask everyone else uh, to do the same and we'll move on to our second uh, presenter who is uh, Dr. Inga Martin-Kyote who uh, is joining us today uh, teaches public international law and dispute resolution at the law faculty of Vilnius University. Uh, she has a PhD from the National University of Singapore, is a qualified lawyer uh, on the exit panel of arbitrators and has acted as an arbitrator in the past. Her current work focuses uh, on the tensions in ISDS between individualistic and communitarian uh, understandings of property. Uh, and she's currently working on a book entitled National Property Laws and uh, International Law on Investment Protection. So Inga, please uh, take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for organizing this very important discussion that I'm um, very glad to join. So my topic today is the distribution of wealth on national and international level. And I'm looking at the question through the prism of property, how those disputes are resolved both at the national courts and in the international courts and tribunals. So for the general audience, I would like to give um, a little bit of a context and uh, what is the problem that uh, I'm trying to deal with? So first of all, at the moment, there are a lot of international initiatives to try to reform the investor state dispute settlement system that uh, usually is abbreviated as um, ISDS. And I will use that abbreviation throughout my presentation. Most of the efforts in those um, reforms are focused on procedural aspects like uh, appeal mechanism, the selection of the adjudicators, cost and length of the procedure. Meanwhile, in my opinion, the main problem, the substantive rules of uh, investment protection in international law are sidelined as too controversial and impossible to resolve or almost impossible to reform. So uh, they are just not addressed in, in those uh, efforts at international organizations. Despite some balancing language that we find in the new uh, bilateral investment treaties or free trade agreements that were negotiated recently, most of them, they just seem to lack the appetite to change neoliberal economic policies inherited from the 1990s, and they just continue in, in that style. And that involves uh, uh, Canada and European Union um, agreement, 
the European Union and Singaporean Investment Protection Agreement, and also United States, Mexico, Canada Agreement too. This leaves us with the interpretations and practices of investment tribunals that are geared towards the preservation of status quo of wealth distribution. Because at the core of BITs and other multilateral investment protection treaties is the prohibition of wealth distribution without compensation, as was uh, already explained by Kiaran, it, it was many, many examples. So investment treaties allow regulation in principle and change of regulation, but if the regulation interferes with private rights, bilateral investment treaties usually oblige a state to compensate the investor. And for instance, uh, we have a case, Magyar Farming Company versus Hungary, which involves 760 hectares of agricultural land in Hungary. In 2010, 2014, Hungary tried to uh, implement the reform of agricultural land by uh, redistributing state-owned and leased land and giving preference for young local uh, farmers. Uh, the claimant in the case was um, a foreign company, and um, they lost in the process a preemptive right. That means the right to continue to renew the lease agreement over this 760 hectares. They lost it because this land plot was just uh, given for the lease to some other local Hungarian guys. And uh, the claimant, um, the foreign investor, um, approached the uh, investment tribunal and won the case. They got the compensation. And that was not even for the actual ownership of the land, but just for this preemption right, the right you know, to the future, to conclude the lease agreement. The land itself was state owned. So, you know. States that have a network of those bilateral investment treaties, they are kind of locked in the uh, relationship and economic structures that already exist. It's very difficult for them to change those uh, practices. And if they want to change, they have to uh, pay compensations for it. And this example is symptomatic and illustrates the general trend that BATs and investment arbitration are molded upon the neoliberal framework of property protection, which prioritizes individual interest over general interest, investors' interest over the uh, general society's needs, like in the Hungarian case, that was the need to uh, revitalize in, uh, the countryside to solve the economic and social problems in the countries. Side. Uh, and uh, that means that in state in interference with private rights, uh, even if they are for public good, they require compensation. So that's the rule under international uh, law and in particular BITs. And uh, of course, the amount of compensation is the full market value, which puts the individual, the investor, into an economic situation that he was before the uh, regulatory change. It means that any significant redistribution of wealth under international investment treaties is impossible because ISDS will put the affected individuals back into their original position. In this case, the outcome was that investor who lost this preemption uh, lease right has to be compensated by a state. And if individuals are compensated for any loss, the regulatory change is only illusionary and no real economic reforms are possible. So how do I approach uh, the problem? The previous academic scholarship was focused on the regulatory chill, the right to regulate, freedom to regulate. And now it is almost universally agreed that yes, of course, state has a right to regulate, but if the regulation goes too far, then the state has to compensate. 
And um, this question is uh, not only in international investment disputes. It is a crucial problem um, that exists for centuries in the national legal system. And that's why I'm looking at different national legal systems. How do they deal with the um, same or similar problems? And some critics might uh, ask, why do we care to look at the national legal systems? Because uh, here we have international treaties. Uh, they are autonomous, independent. Uh, the treaties provide the standards. We just apply international treaties. Why should we look at all those complicated national laws and all the uh, problems that we tried to escape by uh, concluding bilateral investment treaties? And my answer to this criticism is that in, uh, this comparative perspective makes us more sensitive and allows noticing connections and differences in the context that were obscured before. And I have three main insights out of those comparisons. So the first one is that there's a constant cross-fertilization between different ideas and theories at the national and international uh, legal systems. As an example is legitimate expectations. It originated from the continental administrative law, but spread widely in international investment arbitration acquiring a meaning that goes far beyond its original content in national law. And it just cross-fertilized the national law within the national law, and it just uh, went off in um, international investment law. The second observation is that comparative method is a natural lab allowing experimentation with different regimes. And it allows seeing implications, uh, what is possible and, uh, what is allowed under higher property protection or lower property protection, and which of them is more conductive to the economic development and which one allows to achieve uh, uh, um, higher living standards in different uh, countries or different societies. And uh, there are some examples in the Japanese land reform and the Cambodian land reform. Uh, but that we can compare and uh, make our own conclusions, you know, what uh, approach is better. And third insight that uh, is uh, produced by this comparative analysis is that different national understandings of property are creeping into international investment law through interpretations and biases of the arbitrators anyway. So it is better to study, analyze, and acknowledge those different understandings of property instead of just denying their existence. So we can notice, we can see how different ideologies, how different preferences, neoliberal or individualistic, how do they translate into arbitration awards and we can identify those uh, uh, preferences in uh, the works or the awards of some arbitrators. And bearing in mind that most of the arbitrators come from Western developed states, and it's possible to analyze the, the data statistically, we also can make some conclusions of uh, what kind of ideology is preferred in the um, international investment arbitration. So now turning to my main insight is that national legal systems, including Western developed states, they integrate community interest in those disputes and are able to redistribute property much better than international law. And by international law, I primarily, I mean international arbitration. Uh, because, uh, you know, separately international law, like, uh, as a public international law, they don't have too many kind of uh, property economic disputes. Most of those disputes are within uh, ISDS, within um, the framework of um, investment arbitration. And uh, now I would like to examine three areas, kind of um, three areas of general interest and how different disputes are resolved within those areas. 
And through them, through the examples, I hope that you will see that uh, international investment law and in particular investment arbitration, they are antagonistic to the redistribution of wealth within a society. While the national legal systems, they are more favorable to the redistribution. If similar dispute is heard at the national level within the national legal system, because national legal system has uh, you know, a broader kind of holistic legal system that includes the protection of the interest of the community, the, it protects other considerations, other interests. So usually national uh, cases, national solutions, they are more favorable to the uh, wealth redistribution, including the Western developed societies. And I'm not even talking about the developing states that have very, uh, uh, whose uh, national legal systems are very communitarian and they do redistribute wealth uh, quite uh, frequently and to a great extent. So first uh, of all, the first um, area of general interest is health and safety. So there are many disputes that involve uh, the general consideration of health and safety. And under this heading, we have a number of situations and cases where individual interests clash with general communities' interests expressed in some form of regulation. And usually neither the property nor investment may be used in a way that endangers or poses threat to the health or safety of other uh, people. I think it's well established principle in most of the legal systems, and uh, I think it finds uh, uh, itself in the common law also as the principle of uh, nuisance. And there are some very old examples from 1887, like Muglier versus Kansas and slaughterhouse cases. And those are American cases. So, you know, even uh, back then, there was a notion that community interests protected through some regulations, even if those regulations are interfering with private property rights, they don't need to be compensated. And we have a lot of examples like Belfast Corporation versus OD cars from the UK, which basically says the same, it is possible to regulate with the interference over the private property rights or investment, and not to pay compensation. And it is recognized in many uh, Western developed uh, uh, legal systems. While at international um, investment arbitration, this is also to a certain extent recognized as a defense of a state. And here I have in mind uh, um, several cases like uh, Philip Morris versus Australia, and probably everybody knows the facts of the case, of course, it's a plain packaging um, uh, dispute, where especially against Philip Morris versus Uruguay, where it was held that the state's regulation of the tobacco marketing is a legitimate measure to protect public health, therefore any infringement or interference with the investment or uh, intellectual property or uh, any kind of a property, those uh, uh, limitations are legitimate and don't need to be compensated. But uh, unfortunately, we do have many other cases uh, uh, in international arbitration where health and safety were, were not recognized to the same extent as in the national laws. And here in mind, I have Wattenfall case, which of course borders on the kind of environmental consideration, but also health and safety, because it's health and safety of the people, but also of the environment. So here in Wattenfall case, it was very promising case, very interesting case to follow. But of course, the uh, German uh, constitutional court ruled that uh, the German state violated certain legitimate expectations of those nuclear power plants. And uh, after the constitutional court decision that there was a violation of legitimate expectations, uh, 
Very quickly, uh, Germany settled the investment arbitration at Ixit, paying 2.4 billion euros for those owners of nuclear power plants. Although the reason behind the regulation, of course, was very, very good. Um, the government wanted to avoid possible nuclear disasters and uh, it was not sufficiently convincing really to kind of avoid the compensation or at least to avoid uh, the settlement. So the government uh, Hang settled on Just two more minutes. Thank you. Um, I, I see. So very, very quickly, I want to cover uh, two other areas of this contestation. So one area of contestation, the second one is environment that I touched um, very briefly. And environmental matters are much more contested than health and safety. They frequently uh, feature in investment arbitration as defenses of a state. For example, um, a state wanted to preserve the environment, and they wanted to uh, establish the nature reserve, or they wanted to uh, prohibit the use of certain chemicals or additives, and those regulations interfered with certain business models or just the use of the property of investor and the investor uh, claimed uh, the damages or the compensation uh, in uh, various uh, investment tribunals. So investment tribunals are much more critical about those environmental defenses of the state. And uh, it, it depends then on a case. But what I wanted to stress that we do have at the national level, many more cases that are very protective of the environment. And the same kind of recognition, acknowledgement of the general interest of the society to protect environment is not reflected in the investment um, arbitrations and the awards. And there are some speculative reasons for that. One of them is because ISDS is fragmented. So what the tribunals say, they say, we don't have jurisdiction to hear environmental complaints. We cannot really address them. So this, the investment tribunal's sole purpose is to look whether there was any harm to the investment. And because they are so fixated and kind of fragment themselves in this um, little box, they are not addressing other environmental concerns. And the final area of contestations where all this kind of wealth redistribution is happening or not happening but on various levels is land use and herbal, urban planning. And it also has some contradictive decisions. Uh, usually at the national level, uh, the government, the municipalities, they are given you know, this uh, kind of a benefit of the doubt. If they establish certain plans for uh, a town or uh, an area, usually national courts and uh, national tribunals, uh, constitutional tribunals, if um, there are in, in a particular state, they do uh, recognize that such a regulation might be beneficial for the general society. And they allow a greater interference with private property rights for the benefit of the general society without the compensation. At the investment arbitration level, at the international level, the investment tribunals are much stricter. Like they do not allow the level of interference with uh, investments as in the national law. Again, you know, maybe for the same reason, because investment tribunals do care only about the protection of investments because the BITs, they talk only about investment protection and they don't care about other, uh, other people, other interests and other considerations. So my conclusions, <laughs> just uh, a few um, final points on it. So there are several implications looking at those differences, how those disputes are resolved at the national and international level. And uh, uh, BITs and investment arbitration with its universal aspirations is not only ignoring local socioeconomic context, but also exports extremely individualistic uh, 
recipe for wealth accumulation and uh, is antagonistic for the wealth distribution. And this recipe is not necessarily a good fit for a particular state, a region, or globally. And I would be happy to invite the discussion on it. So what would be the good balance between individual interest and the general interest? And how much regulation is too much? Great, thank you very much. Uh, I think that ties in or follows on quite nicely from Kiran's presentation, and hopefully we can address common issues uh, to both presentations. After we hear from our third uh, speaker today, who is Gabrielle Ledna, who is Assistant Professor of International Law at the Danube University Krems. Uh, he holds a PhD from the University of Vienna. Uh, he is also a fellow at the Stanford Law School and has been since 2014. He's, as far as I understand it, currently working on his habilitation, uh, which is, has the working title of Domestic Law Concepts in International Investment Arbitration. So again, I can already Already see uh, a link with uh, Inga's uh, presentation, so it will be interesting to see what you have to say on each other's work. Um, Gabrielle's monograph, the UN Security Council and the International Criminal Court, was the recipient of the Science Prize uh, of Lower Austria in uh, 2020. Uh, his presentation is going to be on ISDS uh, and the relationship between intellectual property uh, and investment chapters. Uh, considering uh, more specifically distributional uh, inequities. So uh, with that, I will hand the floor over to you, uh, Gabrielle. Aim for 15 minutes if you can, and then we'll get the discussion uh, started. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the kind introduction and also for having me. This is really a great panel and I, I can really immediately um, con continue with uh, the framing that Inger Inga has, has uh, done already. And uh, because I, I'd, I'd like to uh, perhaps zoom in on, on some of the questions that Inga has outlined with, with respect to wealth distribution and uh, questions of property uh, and the, the, the question of uh, national uh, disputes versus international disputes. And so in, in a way, I'm, I'm kind of zooming in to a particular question. Uh, so this, uh, I, I prepared some slides. So this is going to be a bit um, uh, more technical. So I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that fits uh, uh, the previous uh, speaker's outlines very well so that we uh, look at a specific issue and uh, talk about some of the less obvious um, distributional impacts of what looks like a very technical question of uh, the relationship between uh, IP chapters in free, free trade ag agreements along with the investment uh, chapters with the big difference usually being that with the uh, investment arbitration you have access to ISDS uh, for foreign investors, uh, whereas in, in IP treaties um, and IP chapters in free trade agreements you have state-to-state -state dispute settlement. And so, so I'd like to zoom uh, in on that and to kind of outline how um, through the interpretation of this relationship, the IP rights and property rights generally are expanded um, uh, in, through ISDS and the you know, right to regulate is, is one of the... Um, buzzwords out there, but the, the, the rights uh, of sovereignty, on the other hand, are um, uh, therefore uh, limited. So let's uh, just a brief background on, on this issue that, that I'm addressing here. So there has been a growing body of, body of literature uh, to suggest that, well, intellectual property rights are, uh, along with other international IP treaties, also protected through international investment agreements. If you look at the uh, wording of some of the definitions that you find of what constitutes investments, a lot of, uh, at least that a type uh, of investment uh, that, uh, that, uh, that is covered uh, might be intellectual property rights and might even discuss this and define this uh, 
further. And the worry in this literature was on, on one part that, well, this would eradicate TRIPS flexibility. flexibility. So, so the grand bargain, so to say, uh, between develop, uh, developed and uh, developing states within the WTO, uh, where, of course, the, the, uh, the multilateral um, uh, avenue there you know, resulted in, in a compromise that you know, didn't satisfy uh, developing countries much, but it, it uh, was a, a compromise and gave uh, certain flexibilities to uh, develop, uh, developing countries. And, and the worry is that uh, through ISDS, which now uh, uh, got this attention and uh, uh, where um, practitioners and, uh, and investors saw a potential to enforce uh, using the vehicle of uh, ISDS to enforce their I IP rights, which they can only uh, indirectly uh, through state-to-state uh, -state dispute settlement like in the WTO or in, in chapters uh, that you have in free trade agreements like in CETA or in the NAFTA agreement and so on. So that's why some, uh, I, 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 I quote Brian Mercurio, who talked about the awakening the sleeping giant, that once we open or another article called it "Open the floodgates for these kind of claims." It will, it will um, uh, have uh, significant consequences um, in in that regard. We have a couple of cases. Uh, I will briefly uh, mention them. None of which uh, were decided in favor of the investor. But I would argue that um, you know because the level of protection remains unclear, and we we have been talking about this. Um, of course, there is a tendency for expansive interpretations of these protection standards. So um, there, there is a worry that this would result in a, in a somewhat at least indirect effect of uh, a regulatory uh, chill. And of course, the, the, the more obvious uh, distributional effects of um, uh, wealth distribution um, for, in favor of uh, those holders of, of IP, if we talk about health, and the big pharmaceutical uh, companies that are then able to sue states if, if they're, they, they feel that their intellectual property rights are uh, violated. And then another uh, way of looking at it from the perspective of um, sovereignty versus property in some, some uh, broad strokes is that actually recent treaty practice suggested, well, states are also worrying about this and, and uh, tried to limit uh, the the scope or the potential for these kind of uh, um, uh, disputes to be settled through ISDS. Uh, Philip Morris uh, against Australia was mentioned already by uh, Inga, or the uh, the which was um, uh, you know not, not didn't go to the merits, but in in uh, uh, Philip Morris v. Uruguay we had a decision on the merits decided in favor of the state, but of course, that was a wake-up call. Uh, one particular result was the tobacco carve-out in the CPTPP. And so what about uh, distribution uh, when, when looking up, uh, at these IP treaties? Um, uh, Gatti and Ho said, well, there we can identify a strategy by IP companies to, to destabilize the balance struck in IP regimes, just such as the WTO. And again, even that has been criticized. So it's not I'm not suggesting that you know the trips balance is perfect and uh, and uh, the the balance struck by other international IP regimes, which are specialized regimes, are now undermined and and that's a that's a threat. I'm not saying that, but there's an additional expansion um, when we look at how this is you know it that's not enough for foreign investors because you know they have to lobby their states and and so on and you don't have direct access to compensation and and all of this. And that this, uh, um, uh, they destabilize this balance struck of IP regimes, such as the WTO, with a view to creating counter norms and rewrite domestic and international laws and regulations that the industry considers to be inconsistent with uh, their IP rights. So that ties in and, and I think complements what Inga said previously, that we can see this, um, this expansion of um, property rights in the IP regime where where, uh, especially in the multilateral uh, negotiations, there has been at least an attempt, or at least uh, the, uh, the the telos of these uh, 
uh, agreements was to strike a balance between private interest and, and, and uh, public interest. But now through uh, ICS challenge, that is also undermined so that uh, uh, domestic and international laws and regulations are then um, being challenged on, on that uh, uh, on that level, so so that's the stakes of of the debate. Developed states, technology comp, uh, uh, companies, voicing concern of uh, insufficient level of protection. And on the other hand, uh, you have you know discussions of access to health uh, and uh, access to medicine and know how information, telecommunication technologies uh, that are actually obstructed from the perspective of developing uh, states. Uh, for example, and um, and so that's the stakes of, of the debate and the technical legal question, of course, we can look at um, IPRs, you know, they're mentioned in these trees, so prima facie, they are covered. Um, so, you know, they might be and, uh, you know, they might be subject to uh, claims by foreign investors when, um, you know, certain limitations, revocations, other ir interference uh, with IPRs. Um, are a result of state measures. And then, you know, we have the familiar uh, protection standards that might be um, uh, uh, re relevant here. And as I mentioned, the big advantage, of course, is the procedural aspect of it, um, where foreign investors have direct access to um, challenge these uh, state measures that negatively infect, affect their IP systems. Whereas you know, in, in uh, the IP regime, generally you, you would have to go to, to state to state. So it's not as, as effective. And then of course, the question is how to, how to uh, decide questions of jurisdiction. So when there is a specialized regime already on uh, with, uh, with regards to IP treaties and chapters in free trade agreements, uh, such as NAFTA or the CETA uh, or also mentioned previously, um, and the TRIPS, which um, also has its own dispute settlement uh, system, how to resolve these um, uh, potential uh, conflicts of jurisdiction. There has been a, a couple of cases, but the, the question of how jurisdiction is being decided was not really discussed that much. Eli Lilly v. Canada was decided in the favor of, of the state. The case concerned um, the in, invalidation of two patents due to a new uh, Canadian uh, um, uh, doctrine that, that was developed through case law, promise utility doctrine, which invalidated two patents. Um, and so Eli Lilly claimed that, you know, uh, that's a violation of fair and equitable treatment or, or they were expropriated. It was um, not um, decided on the, uh, on, in favor of the state. And Canada also uh, argued that, well, you cannot litigate uh, TRIPS violations or um, the IP chapter of NAFTA through investment arbitration. But the tribunal, of course, saw uh, this as an investment and that potentially there is no conflict of jurisdiction in, in that case because also in NAFTA case law uh, and WTA, uh, WTO case law, um, it's, it's complementary protection standards. So it's only because it's also a question of trading goods or trading services or IP, that doesn't mean, that doesn't exclude the potential of being an issue also of investment uh, uh, protection. Philip Morris, we already discussed there, you, we didn't have the question of an uh, applicable IP um, chapter, but of course the same question um, with regards to the TRIPS agreement and um, the, the uh, standards for trademark protection uh, could be also um, uh, relevant for the TRIPS agreement, a potential TRIPS violation, or in case of Australia, where this was actually litigated also in the WTO, um, where you had questions of um, uh, TRIPS conformity also settled. So there are these parallel forms. Also in, in the case of Australia, decided in favor of uh, Australia in, in the WTO panel report and then the appellate body report that we all had uh, last summer. Summer, I think it was issued. Um, Bridgestone in Panama um, does not concern um, uh, health, uh, but this is an interesting case because uh, it, it was a very technical issue of opposition um, uh, procedures initiated by um, against a competitor of Bridgestone, uh, holder of the, and owner of the trademark for the, this, these tires that were produced. 
Um, and because of that um, opposition proceedings that were held to be in ill, uh, ill faith um, uh, by the Panamanian Supreme Court, there were damages um, awarded and, and, and bridge uh, damages awarded to the competitor. So Bridgestone then uh, claimed that this is a denial of justice. And it's an interesting case because uh, here uh, the jurisdictional hurdle to be taken was actually a question of whether uh, this constitutes an investment, the trademarks uh, uh, themselves. And it was held that, well, if they are exploited, so um, uh, that they're marketed, their their sales of the products bearing the mark, um, post-sale services being uh, done, that this, this constitutes together with the trademark uh, a covered in investment. But there it's also an interesting case because you also had uh, the applicable investment chapter of that dispute was um, the U.S. Panamanian uh, TPA, which included an IP chapter, which had similar conflict rules that we that uh, we have in CP, TP, TPP um, and in NAFTA and, and so on. So that's why it's interesting to think about this. This was not even an issue um, of the proceedings. So the relationship between uh, IP chapter an investment chapter was was not even uh, raised, but I want to raise it here. So, I mean, you have in the TRIPS agreement uh, and WTO generally that, of course, uh, you know, it, it should be exclusively um, uh, litigated under Article 23 through the state to state dispute settlement and the conflict clause that you you find in, in uh, with respect to IP and investment chapter usually is something along these lines that I put here, that in the event of any inconsistency between this investment chapter and another chapter of this agreement, the other chapter shall prevail to the extent of the inconsistency. So is that an inconsistency? Um, um, and uh, usually if we go to some, some of the case law, it, it is not uh, sufficient to claim only because the IP chapter might um, permit broader uh, measures with regards to trademark op opposition proceedings and has some regulation uh, there. That does not mean that it is inconsistent with um, investment protection standards, um, but it's still interesting to see and identify here uh, that you know, it depends on, on, on the understanding of what uh, inconsistency means, what the conflict um, uh, of norms uh, is, is, um, is constituted and how this is to be interpreted. But in effect, what is interesting from a distributional perspective is, of course, that when you shift um, a dispute uh, being settled from IP chapter that's litigated from state to state, dispute settlement, to a system where you have uh, direct access of foreign investors, you shift from, um, I'm, and, and with regards to the WTO, of course, from the multilateral agreement and, or the state to state um, uh, part of the agreement of an IP chapter. So from so sovereignty to the bilateral agreements um, and ISDS to then with the result to expand uh, these property uh, rights further. And it's interesting because I mentioned treaty practice and, and the, that's, that's the final point I want to make. The treaty practice indicates that um, states are, are very much uh, aware of this being a potential issue and that they want to limit these kind of disputes being litigated uh, via ISDS. So there has been, um, with, res with respect to the protection standards, um, that uh, a clarification that this article on uh, expropriation does not apply to the issuance of compulsory licenses in accordance with um, that are consistent with the with the TRIPS agreement and a further we had that already in the U.S. model agreements and this is quite common but then the further um, clarification that the revocation limitation or creation of intellectual property rights to the extent that these measures are consistent with TRIPS or chapter 20 do not constitute expropriation. And also then the, the, the kind of uh, a contrario argument that you could already think about is also captured by the second sentence here. Moreover, a determination that these measures are inconsistent does not establish an expropriation. So in, in, in other words, uh, treaty practice suggests, and I have uh, another slide of this 
another uh, clarification that wants to uh, limit uh, the question of intellectual property right to re reserve this uh, domain of intellectual property right to the state and to domestic uh, law and that the parties even agree to review the relation between intellectual property rights and investment discipline within three years uh, after the entry into force. So you can see that there is some worry about uh, these uh, kind of questions and the relationship between uh, these two uh, regulatory regimes. So in conclusion, I, it, what has not materialized is you know, a flood uh, gate opened and there were a huge number of cases. We have a couple of cases all decided in favor of the state. But of course, they left the door open. I mean, Philip Morris v. Uruguay, we had a strong, powerful dissenting opinion by, by Gary Bourne. Uh, so of course, that can be used in future litigation. Recent treaty practice suggests a restrictive approach, but we all know, and Inga also mentioned this, well, um, case law um, and the, the, the dynamics within the regime suggest a further expansions uh, of this. And I think it's, it's um, uh, an example of this is the fact that it has not really been discussed that there might be a jurisdictional uh, conflict and it might be better um, to um, reserve disputes around uh, intellectual property to the specialized regime uh, that deal with intellectual property. Um, and so in, on, on the more technical level, we can see that uh, distributional consequences are also happening on the interpretive level of whether uh, and how to litigate uh, IP disputes. In, in that regard, of course, with, uh, uh, with an, an um, uh, shift in the kind of bargaining power from, away from uh, the, the states uh, and toward private actors, you know, including not only uh, the big IP uh, companies, but also um, the, the arbitrators and, uh, and the ISDS uh, system and network. So that's it from uh, my side. Thanks a lot for your attention. I'm looking forward to questions later. Great, thank you very much. I think that was three really excellent papers. Um, I'd like to take this chance actually now before we even start the discussion to, to thank you for that. I think it was really super interesting. Um, does anyone have a question that they would like to ask um, right now um, before I uh, abuse my position as chair to, to ask mine? Um, please feel free to stick your hand up uh, or to type your question uh, into the chat. Um, any questions? Well, maybe I can kick us off then. Um, Kiran, if I could start with you. I think your uh, presentation was really fascinating and super rich. I think really useful for uh, investment lawyers to learn a bit more about you know, these concepts that we are so used to using and to teaching our students. Of course, you know, <laughs> when we teach uh, expropriation in seminar two or three uh, and we talk uh, about uh, the the Hull formula, we you know are used to talking about the Hull formula as if we know what it is. But of course, we don't often appreciate that you know these things don't exist in a vacuum, and there's actually such a, a rich history and such, and the context surrounding the Hull formula that, that you mentioned uh, really had such an impact on that. And so, I mean, I, I learned a lot. <clears throat> excuse me, from your presentation, and and I think it's very valuable what you're doing. Uh, I had two questions which kind of are designed to, to push you a bit more um, towards the investment law side of things, which you, you mentioned towards the end of your, your presentation, but in, in less detail. Um, you mentioned um, Martins Paparinsky's recent work on, on crippling compensation, and uh, our Glasgow colleague here, Tony Marzal, has also recently written on calculation of compensation, um, which uh, I think is maybe slightly more um, technical in terms of, of the means that we use for, for calculating compensation. Um, and I was wondering whether um, your argument really was that, that compensation uh, was never appropriate or was always a barrier to redistribution, uh, or whether it is more that you are you see this type of large-scale crippling compensation uh, as a bar and you would maybe advocate uh, a move 
uh, back towards uh, something maybe more like the um, appropriate compensation standard of, of the new international economic order. Um, beyond that, the other question that I had was related uh, to this thing, you know, we tell students that there's this difference between direct expropriation and indirect expropriation. I was wondering if you take this into account uh, in your work, um, especially since, you know, we also tell uh, students that expropriation, yes, it has a long history. Uh, it's, uh, you know, one of the most well-established standards of protection. But, you know, these days it's kind of all about FET, right? You know, and actually you, you mentioned some examples of expropriation there, but it is not the standard of protection, which is um, the fate, is the darling of, of the investor in terms of claims made and certainly in, in terms of successful claims either. So I wonder if you take that uh, into account uh, in your work. Inga, I have a question for you, which is, I think, a very straightforward one. I mean, what do you say to those who come back at you and just say, look, states knew what they were doing when they entered into these BITs, right? They knew exactly the standards of protection that they were offering. Yes, okay, maybe domestic law regulates uh, or accounts for public interest better than international investment law does, but that's the way that the, the system, international investment law, was designed by states, right? It's no accident, right? This is not a bug. This is actually the system. What do you say to that type of argument? And maybe related to that, what can be done, right? Since states have made this system, you know, you mentioned that uh, the working group um, at InsoTrial is not really looking at substantive issues at all. Um, do we require states themselves to revisit the system that they have built? Or is there something that can be done, for example, through legal interpretation, through uh, arbitral tribunals, the type of which you have uh, been a part of in the past? Um, and finally, Gabrielle, I have a question for you as well. I mean, I find this really interesting and it's just more a question out of curiosity. What do you attribute this willingness of arbitral tribunals to find that they have jurisdiction in relation to IP issues? What, what do you attribute that to? I mean, it seems on the face of it to be wrong, right? Or at least dodgy, right? So why are these arbitrators so keen to uh, get their hands on this? Is it just because... Um, it will get them a few days more uh, remuneration uh, for their jobs? Or is there something else going on here? I wonder if you have any thoughts uh, about this. Uh, and apologies for the long questions. Uh, I should start, I take it, yeah. Um, hey, thank you very much for the feedback and uh, great questions as well. Um, you could probably tell from the tone of what I said that I'm not really um, designing reforms. Um, but I, w I don't dismiss the idea of this, um, um, this prohibition on confiscation, if you like. I don't dismiss that its value entirely. But I think what the Hull formula and also um, US takings law share is that they both have Actually, it's, it's outside the whole formula, but the whole formula is normally articulated with the public purpose as well. And this is exactly the same as in the Fifth Amendment. You have that there has to be compensation and there has to be a public purpose. And what that, what that leaves open is what if the public purpose is not to compensate? What if that is the purpose? What if there is a re redistributive um, political motive? And that was precisely what the Fifth Amendment was designed to, to uh, block. And so... I think that by by having this kind of dual character, this this uh, dual um, conditions, then um, this the strict application of how just leads to to um, there's no there's no uh, room to play um, with the valuation, and this was the whole to me the whole problem of the the challenge of the new international economic order. Um, I could talk a lot more about that, but I'll go on to your second question about direct indirect. I think it's also really interesting point, and that is also something I, I see that develops also in U, US takings jurisprudence in the in the 19th century. Um, but I think there's also something to, I, I would be interested to hear from the other presenters as well on this about 
whether there's a need for us to start rethinking about this regulative and distributive distinction, because I think this is really key to what it, this direct indirect um, definition uh, belongs to. And I think maybe we, we accept that distinction too quickly because a lot of regulation is distributive, perhaps all regulation is distributive. So um, what's the purpose of, um, of this direct um, co uh, concept of the direct expropriation? And I, I'm thinking a lot about whether um, particularly, um, as you mentioned, the FET standard is really like the key standard that's being invoked in these treaties and direct expropriation is more or less a thing of the past. Um, except in extreme, uh, like uh, quite uh, unusual cases like in Zimbabwe. But um, the, the whole structure of investment protection requires it still. It, it needs it as an analogy. And it's a similar situation in, in the US jurisprudence. So there's this uh, constant refer references to physicality and materiality um, and the property object. And that's obviously in legal thought also evolved a lot in the last 200 years around the idea of bundles of rights and, and the, the property object. But I think the, the thing uh, that law seems to be holding on to the object for is valuation. Because this is like the, the, um, the compensatory requirement logically fits to this, to this idea of there being a unit of exchange, like an, a property object, even though the, the legal um, discourses developed like much beyond that. So I think although all, uh, most of the cases are on the FET standard, perhaps we wouldn't even really accept them if the prohibition of direct expropriation wasn't in there. Because that is, that is like the analogy that everything else is uh, built around, to me at least anyway. Um, yeah, I'd be interested if the others also have any thoughts on those questions, but thank you. I think that's a really interesting answer and also makes me, you know, start to question the fact that we always teach expropriation first <laughs> as the standard of protection and then the rest follow. I think uh, maybe that's not a coincidence. Uh, Inga? Yeah, right. Um, thank you for this uh, kind of uh, bringing up the standard critique, right, um, that states knew what they were uh, signing up to. And I would say this is the great fallacy of investment arbitration. States didn't knew because there was no investment arbitration practice back then. Most of BITs were signed in the 90s, like when all the Eastern Bloc came you know, after the crumbling uh, Soviet Union. So that's when most of the BITs were concluded. And in the 90s, there were no um, extensive interpretations of what those three words, fear and equitable treaty standard mean. All the interpretations came later around the year 2000. And then it became apparent the extent of the obligations. So I, I, I don't think that states knew them when, when they were signing those BITs, what it means. But and you could also say, for example, that they, uh, oh, sorry to jump in, but I was just going to say, yeah, okay, maybe they didn't know at that time, for example, how FET was going to be interpreted, but they could have thought about incorporating police powers, public health, safety exceptions into the, those treaties at the time, right? This would not have been completely far-fetched, and they didn't. Another interesting aspect about uh, negotiating and concluding BITs is that the concepts that are used for the BITs like uh, property, movable, immovable, contractual rights, um, IP rights, you know, every contracting state interprets those concepts you know, from within their own legal system. And when you have like continental legal systems, when they don't think that contractual rights are property, they signing the BIT would never have thought that termination of a simple commercial contract will be equated to indirect expropriation because contractual rights may be treated as property under the common law or American law, which became the dominant interpretation in investment arbitration. 
So, you know, those kind of very different understandings, uh, what do we bring uh, to the table and uh, into the treaty? I think it played a major role and it, it continues playing because also, you know, even if you already have a treaty and if a state, uh, state institutions, municipalities or agencies, when they try to deal with some uh, kind of uh, problem investment or um, have a dispute or emerging dispute and they are trying to either settle it or to resolve it, you know, when they uh, look and read into the BIT, they read it through their national understanding, what is required of the state official, what to do and what are the limits, what state officials are prohibited to do to the investor or investment. And they apply it through their national understanding of how they perceive um, a state's role in the economy. And obviously, those states that have this kind of communitarian understanding of property, you know, how they deal with the nationals, with the national property, they will extend the same kind of treatment to the foreign property and foreign investors. So those interpretations, they are pervasive. They don't stop at the negotiating table. They continue throughout the application. And they even uh, are very prominent in the dispute resolution stage, because as I mentioned, the arbitrators, they bring their own understanding from their educational background. What does it mean to protect investment? And they um, unconsciously associate that protection of investment with the protection of property, how the property is protected, how it should be protected in their home state. And that's how those kind of Western individualistic understandings of property get exported around the world with the pretense that it is universal standard, but it's not because rarely there were any comparative studies what the property protection in those other countries, in the developing countries, how does it look, how is it understood, and very often it is understood much more narrower than in the Western world. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an absolutely evergreen issue, right? How the, the baggage that lawyers bring to international law, you know, we're trained in domestic law, then moving to the international plane, and how domestic law concepts are, are sort of translated, how they move through the kaleidoscope, put onto the international plane. Um, Philippo, I see that your hand is raised. You have a question for Inga. I'm keen to get to, to let Gabrielle speak first and then we'll come to you if that's okay. Yeah, Gabrielle, please. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, you know, that it's um, more speculation how that comes about that uh, tribunals assume jurisdiction in the area that's not, you know, at least at the first look innate uh, built in uh, or a classical case of investment arbitration. But I think also what uh, uh, Inga was just talking about, um, there is this understanding um, or what you just mentioned that the baggage uh, or, or, or the kind of um, um, backpack that, that uh, lawyers and especially investment lawyers are, are bringing to decisions like that. And they will look at IP assets as just any other assets. They, there, there are few uh, who are really IP experts who are also doing investment arbitration and to them. I mean, it's even in the name, intellectual property. So it's property, uh, it's, uh, it's something that can be taken. It, um, so, and, and it's worth something and it's, it's uh, worth a lot. So I think uh, that's uh, a part of the explanation that of course, um, not only have, do you have it in the in the text, so in most definitions it's actually mentioned. You know that doesn't mean that their their um, uh, negotiators were in, in intending for uh, these bits that we now have uh, ever being brought. But of course, it's something that can be used uh, later on, and uh, you know, creative uh, lawyers can do a lot with with uh, text, and I think they they have done so. And um, and then I think the the interesting thing is that 
that these arbitrators might lack the sensi sensibility or the knowledge um, uh, where and what purpose intellectual property rights have. And then we're back in the question of the, the domestic law concepts th that are then being um, uh, used and decided on the international plane where it looks as if there is some international understanding of these, uh, but of course they're not natural concepts. I mean, in, in real property or, or property law generally, it, it, I think it's, it's um, more difficult to, to see that, of course, it's only created by law and it's created by domestic law. In intellectual property law, I think it's more obvious even, but, but then still there, there is uh, a tendency to see and, and um, view these concepts as somewhat internationalized. And, and actually that's the project that, that, that I'm pursuing where one part of it is in the intellectual property, right? But I also look at uh, concepts of property and other domestic law concepts. And I think that's uh, really fascinating because you know it's very technical, but it has a, a lot of um, uh, distributional effects. Yeah, it sounds like we should have this panel again next year once everyone is <laughs> one year further on with their research and then we, we see how, how we're getting on. Um, I realize we're running out of time. I want to go to Filippo just now. And then I think just to round us off, I would let Kiron quickly come back in um, to, to address the question that is in the chat. I don't know if you've had a chance to think uh, a bit more about that, but just to round us off, Filippo, please go ahead. It's a very quick one. Thank you very much, James. And thank you very much to... Uh, the presenters, and it's addressed to Inga, if I may. Uh, and I want, I would like to hear more if you could drill down on the Vattenfall case that you mentioned. That that's the Vattenfall two, the nuclear one, because it seems to me that you use that as a, as a, as an example, as a poster child of this situation of states that want to do good things but are blackmailed by the international ob obligations that they derive from the BIT. And I would like to hear more, if, if you wanted, about the fact that, uh, from what I understand, the German Constitutional Court said that there was a breach of the right to property. So it, it doesn't strike me as a, as, a, as a very convincing example of this story of being hand-tied by the BIT, because you, you could say the same about the German Constitution then. So uh, do you have a comment on that? Because it struck me as the kind of story that gets told a lot, but then nobody mentioned the German constitutional court saying, yeah, this was expropriatory. We need to compensate these people. All right. Uh, it, it's very convoluted dispute and we could spend the entire panel just speaking about this one case. Uh, my reading of the constitutional court decision is that they didn't say that property right was violated. They said that legitimate expectation was violated because of the allotments. Like for some allotments, there were no legitimate expectations. And for some allocations of kind of produced energy, there was a breach because at some point before, the government was making schedules for how long those nuclear power plants can continue operating. And then they uh, kind of allowed it the first time and then changed it, shortening those uh, time periods for the kind of um, uh, allowing them to operate. And exactly because it was already uh, set up once and then they changed it because of that, the constitutional court said that uh, the investor, like generally the energy companies were entitled to expect that they will be con allowed to operate until the um, expiration of this initial schedule. That was my understanding. So it's not exactly the property um, kind of right dispute, but of course, you know, in, in the general kind of uh, picture, of course, uh, it was the, a win for the energy companies. And uh, of course, uh, that was probably used as an argument in the investment arbitration. You know, once kind of a breach of the national law is established, 
it's much easier than to establish the violation of the BIT or at least of one of the standards. And obviously, this would have been uh, legitimate expectations. So it kind of, I, I think it prompted the German government to settle the case because they thought that there are no great prospects uh, in the case. And it's a probably a sad loss for states because Germany basically admitted uh, you know, to, to that standard that in those disputes when health and safety is at stake um, of the society, when environment is at stake in the society, you know, even the German administrative standard is not enough. It has to be even higher. And the German administrative standard is quite high for developing states. You know, so if Germany cannot really follow on, you know, this kind of ideal standard that is uh, ideal for investments, so how can we expect that developing states will have such institutional capacities, administrative capacities uh, to organize the affairs of a state in such a way as not to violate the, the rights of investors. I, I think it kind of raises the bar higher with, with this uh, case. Uh, although there are other cases in Germany, and I think I didn't have time to mention groundwater case, which is an older case from um, 100 years ago, where it was said that the, uh, the, the company that was excavating gravel and using the water in the process, it was prohibited from continuing the, the excavation of the gravel because the nearby town municipality passed the new regulation prohibiting uh, excavation and usage of um, the water because the drinking water was depleting in the town and kind of uh, put under the pressure the reserves of the drinking water. And in that case, it went also you know, to, to the highest courts in Germany. And it was uh, ruled that such regulation, which basically takes away the landowner's right to excavate the gravel because uh, the process endangers the drinking water does not violate the property right of the owner. And that was literally taking of the one of the ownership rights because as I understand under the German law, uh, if you own a land plot, you can do whatever you want with all the kind of underlayers of the land plot, including excavating the gravel. And in this particular case, the owner was prohibited from excavating the gravel because it was affecting the environment. So I so guess Inga, my can, main... I, can I just I'm jump just in going here. on and on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just keen to, to get to, to Kiran and then to let people get their dinners. Um, so if, if you don't mind just to, to round us off just very briefly. <laughs> yeah, I will try. I wrote down something which is not very brief, but um, yeah, I th I'm not. The, the question is a bit vague, but I uh, was. I think I can answer it best insofar as I'm, I'm looking at, like I mentioned in my talk about the black radical tradition and also how this, um, um, how a critique of um, Western metaphysics is developed and I appreciate most people won't think that's very relevant to what we're talking about but I think in terms of the property form there's something about the ont ontology of the thing of property that the black radical tradition is pointing to which is that it's necessarily hyperbolic and speculative and the absolutism this idea of having an unencumbered property right is in a way always a myth um, and even in in um, legal histories of the of property, you see that absolutism kind of comes to a head with um, trans transatlantic slavery. And I think that that's um, yeah, I think that's a ripe sort of area for for further research because um, yeah, it's it's um, I think we we live in that in that legacy today. I think that, yeah, that's the short answer. <laughs> Great. This was a very excellent short answer. I would say thank you very much for this. Um, I was only half joking when I said that we should do this again in, in, in a year's time, uh, because I thought this was a really interesting, really rich panel.
uh, which covered a lot of ground. And I'm very grateful to, to the three of you and to Christopher and to everyone else who joined us today for, for making it a, a very interesting panel. So I will say uh, thank you again one more time and enjoy the rest of Glasgow. Thank you very much, James. Ciao. Bye-bye.